Good afternoon. I'm Martha Pollack, president of Cornell. I am so pleased to welcome all, you all here. And personally, I'm so pleased to be here today to honor Dave Duffield. Dave, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, we're delighted to have your wife, Cheryl, your daughter, Lori, her daughter, Emma, who's a current Cornell student, and her son, Michael, who's also a current Cornell student, and like a good Cornell student, is in class right now. But we're hoping <laughs> he'll, uh, he'll join us soon. Um, we are so proud today to honor Dave with Cornell Engineering's inaugural Distinguished Alumnus Award. Uh, but first, we're going to learn a little bit more about him as he talks with Dean Lance Collins of the College of Engineering. To set the stage, I want to give you just a little bit of background. Dave Duffield graduated from Cornell with a major in electrical engineering in 1962, and he earned his MBA here at Cornell two years later. He is, as I think everyone in this room knows, a legend in the tech industry, having built six companies, two of which are giants in the software industry. The first was PeopleSoft, which became the world's second largest enterprise software company serving higher education, manufacturing, and human resources. Dave served as chairman and CEO until PeopleSoft was acquired by Oracle for $10.3 billion in 2005. Now, some people would have retired at that point, but not Dave. Just a few months later, he co-founded Workday. Today, Workday is a $2.1 billion company with more than 8,200 employees worldwide. It provides cloud-based human capital, financial, and analytics applications to some of the world's largest companies and organizations, including Cornell, which uses Workday's human resources platform. Dave's latest venture and passion in his new, is his new company, Ridgeline, and I know there are a bunch of Ridgeline employees sitting right there in the second row. Ridgeline builds technologies and applications designed to serve the financial services industry. To all of his companies, Dave has brought a strong commitment to customer service, innovation, integrity, and fun. He fosters an employee-friendly atmosphere, celebrating the births of employees' children, congratulating workers on their success, and sometimes even putting pool tables in the office. In fact, I understand that during his student days, Dave was a champion pool player. And when Workday moved to a new location, he won the right to name the street it was on, now called Workday Way, by beating the town's mayor at pool. <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't mention how much I've enjoyed my conversations with Dave. During my first year as president, I was on the road a lot. I was meeting a lot of donors, a lot of alumni. I was a little bit intimidated to go out to Tahoe and meet the famous Dave Duffield. Um, I have to tell you, he was extraordinarily welcoming and kind, and I really, really appreciated that as a new president. Finally, I want to celebrate Dave's philanthropy. Uh, it has transformed the experience of every Cornell engineer over the last two decades, and it will continue to do so for generations to come. Dave and Cheryl are the founding benefactors of Duffield Hall, the heart of Cornell engineering and one of the world's foremost facilities for nanotechnology. It's also a central gathering place for the college and, frankly, all of Cornell, facilitating interdisciplinary collaboration and innovation. The Duffields have also supported Workday Labs here in Phillips Hall and in Gates, Rhodes, and Sage Hall. Through their foundation, Dave, Cheryl, and their family have dedicated more than $300 million to Maddie's Fund, a companion animal welfare organization. In our College of Veterinary Medicine, the fund created the Maddie's Shelter Medicine Program, which trains veterinary students to keep shelter animals healthy and adoptable. Throughout his long career, Dave has proved himself to be a master salesman, a creative, risk-taking entrepreneur, and a fierce competitor who also happens to be an extremely generous philanthropist and a very nice guy. So please join me in welcoming Dave and Lance Collin to the stage to have a conversation. So I was, is the mic on? <laughs> I was not at all aware of the, the pool table story, so that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. Well, I'll play it for another five years of deanship. <laughs> <laughs> you got, you got to keep this guy going. Don't applaud that. That's awful. <laughs> no, no, it's a... Uh, uh, so I, I'm an amateur. I'm an amateur, so I don't, I'm not going to pretend. Um, amateur pool player? Pool player. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
So it is, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you back. I know it's been a number of years. Um, we have spent the morning inundating you with lots and lots of information, but uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Pleasure. Um, and I just wanted to begin, you know, we have a lot of students in the audience, and I, wanted, uh, I want to, uh, in some ways, connect them to you. And I thought I'd start by asking uh, if you could tell us a little bit about your background where you where you're from, a few accomplishments, and what ultimately led you to Cornell, and then what ultimately led you to major in electrical and computer engineering. Okay, uh, I was I was born in Cleveland, and moved to a little town in New Jersey called Hohokus, only double hyphenated name in the country, <laughs> Hohokus, New Jersey, where uh, I I grew up. I was blessed with awesome parents. Um, my mom was a teacher. My dad, uh, neither went to college, by the way. Um, my dad was a project manager for the Nike Zeus program, which was our country's anti-ballistic missile system. So, you know, so this was during the, the 40s, uh, 50s, where you know, there was a, a lot of stuff going on between us and the Soviet Union. Um, so I, he, he was an engineer in uh, I had the good fortune of, as I said, being his son. Um, I also, I did a pretty good job in, in school and in high school. I went to Ridgewood High, uh, graduated 11th out of 511. Uh, got the top math award in our high school. Um, I had an 800 in my math SATs <laughs> and an equally miserable 425 in my... <laughs> English SATs. So I think I held the record in the country, if not the world, for the biggest difference yes. Yes, in SAT scores. Um, I also had the benefit of, of being a decent athlete. I was a co captain of our baseball team and, and all state pitcher, honorable mention, not, not quite the all state, but it's second to somebody. Uh, then um, I was a New Jersey guy, so and my my dad was uh, got me into aeronautical engineering, or at least a passion for that, given that he was in the uh, space business, basically. And so I had my heart set on going to Princeton. <laughs> I've heard of that place. Yeah, I've heard Small of that school place. in Central Jersey. I yeah, and I wanted to study aeronautical engineering, so. Uh, f fortunately, I would say, I was rejected. So um, my second choice was this fine place. And if I'd known now what I, if I'd known now what I knew then, or vice versa, I, I wouldn't have applied to Princeton. I mean, this is just a magnificent place. So, so, so as it turns out, I actually attended Princeton. And, and <laughs> you absolutely made the right decision. <laughs> with all due respect to my alma mater. <laughs> so tell me, can you describe your experience as an engineering student at Cornell and maybe think about or tell some story about what you found most memorable, both in terms of out of classroom and then maybe a class that you took? Yeah, okay. I mean, I had a great six years. By the way, I was in the, in the five-year program, so. And Cornell was really, I would say, entrepreneurial in the sense that I, I was allowed to overlap first year of my business school with the fifth year of my engineering. So that, that was pretty cool. So, um, But I, I was an OK student. I uh, remember signing up for Air Force ROTC. We had to go. You know, the males had to take ROTC because of Cornell's land grant nature. Huh. Um, I don't think you do that anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> to show my wisdom, I signed up for the 8 a.m. class, <laughs> living in university halls, and having to climb all the way up to the top floor of Barton Hall in midwinter. You know? <laughs> so that, that, that was a pretty cool experience. I think another calves, cool, calves of steel. It, it is what I imagine. <laughs> I don't know, or some men, mental deficiency. <laughs> uh, 
But and I, I joined a fraternity, a, a really good one. It's, I, I believe it, it was a jock house when, when I was there. We had most of the hockey players when Cornell was you know, just a fabulous hockey, hockey university. I think we were almost the national champs. Um, and, and then I started this, I didn't start, I joined this rock band. It's called the Choppers. Um, Any choppers in the audience? No. <laughs> we, uh, we, we were the second most popular band on campus behind Bobby and the Counts. Bobby and the Counts was an Ithaca-based band, and they were truly awesome. He, uh, he had a number one hit, Tennessee Waltz. And they were most popular. We were second most. We were loud uh, and, and really a great dance band. I bought a hearse. A real honest to goodness hearse. Uh, I didn't register it, but I, we used it to transport our band equipment uh, to Syracuse, to Colgate, to Cortland State. Uh, we even had a gig in the Apollo Theater in New York City. So uh, we, we were. We were, it was fun. There's obviously a lot of sides of you that I don't know a thing about. <laughs> yeah. Like, not at all. So this is fascinating, okay. And then, uh, my, you mentioned a course. Um, I got interested in um, computer programming and signed up for the introduction to, to programming with uh, professors Conway and Maxwell. And, um, Professor Maxwell is right here in the front. There he is. <laughs> um, I had also then recently fallen in love with my first wife, who happens to be the uh, mom of Lori here and grandmom of, of uh, Emma. So and this was my first love, so I didn't know what to do. So I, my studies, my, I was on the baseball team, here at Cornell, uh, that, that sort of all went haywire. So I'm taking this course from Professor Maxwell. Did terribly. He failed me. <laughs> no kidding, he failed me. I think I got a zero in the course. Did wonders for my GPA. And, but to his credit, and I love you for this, let me retake the same course the following year. And I, and I did okay. Um, but, but the fact that, that, that this guy uh, had the courage to, to fail me and the courage to you know, let me take it again, I think that's pretty, pretty cool. And this so was that, introductory computing. It was. Something that you would spend the rest of your career in. Well, I so it, know, had some, it had some Well, it was off to a bad start. <laughs> uh, now, these are the guys that uh, built Couple. Uh, they wrote the operating system for the CDC 1604, right? Uh, I, I started out on the Burroughs 200 over in the foundry or near the, you know, the architecture school. Uh, and then uh, Bill and Dick uh, wound up getting this magnificent CDC machine. And um, then we wound up being partners together. I, I started this company, um, Information Associates, subsequently Integral. and and. Bill Maxwell was a partner. After I, he failed me in his course, <laughs> we wound up being partners. He wrote this ASAP programming language, which we use as a report writer. Absolutely helped sell our products. Fantastic. So you go from re really bad situation to a very good situation. So I was commenting before we stepped out that as an educator, I think there's no better feeling than when someone is actually, I didn't know the whole story about the failing of the course but at the time, but you know, uh, in, in terms of that recognition. So at this point, um, you have founded six companies and, and two of them have been just astronomical successes. And I just wonder, did you ever think about that that's what you would be doing? Is that something that you, was that a part of a master plan? No, no. No, I, I uh, had the very good fortune uh, graduating from Cornell, graduating for one, <laughs> and then uh, being uh, asked to join IBM in uh, Rochester, New York, their, their branch office there. And I joined IBM at its heyday. I mean, it was just a, the most admired company in the world. It, it had great employees, 
tops in customer service. They were innovative. I was there at the time the System 360 was introduced. I got to play with all, all the machines, the accounting machines, the 1401, all a variety of machines, all sort of aimed towards helping sell IBM products and helping the customers be successful. So um, I, ju I just had a, a, a super time. Why would so I? What, what was the nature of your appointment while you were there? I mean, were, I was, was a it systems sales? engineer. Oh, okay. They tried to get me into sales, but sent me to sales school, and I rebelled. I, I, <laughs> making cold calls on people and you know, following all these protocols <clears throat> it didn't sit well. Wasn't I mean, you, it wasn't for you. Neither of us would would like sales school. Um, but I did. I did have the opportunity. I had tremendous opportunities at IBM. I was promoted, if you will, to the higher education team. Um, we were in the middle of a competition with Control Data, the successor to the 1604. I think it was a 6600. Do you, rem do you remember that as a model? Yeah. yeah. So we were, IBM was competing with the University of Rochester for this business. We were competing with the 360, the big ones, model 6575, versus the Control Data machine. This is a long story, by the way. Mm -hmm. but, but it gives you an idea of what you can do. So uh, the they were going to select the machine. I, it's, the big vote came from the optics department. And I, I'm not going to go on too much. There was a 4,000 uh, card line Fortran program that the optics department ran. That was their whole life. Uh, they happened to be the, the best optics department in the country uh, and the father of optical engineering was a Robert Hopkins. So went to ask him to borrow his program. Looked at it, it predominantly square roots. I'll, I'll cut this short. I, I got the assembler language from IBM, rewrote the square root routine, and wound up speeding the program up by a factor of five. That we won the business uh, over the control data machine. <laughs> Not only did the university get a, a Model 65, but they got a, a Model 50 for the administrative computing. So my, the point of this is join a really cool company, uh, innovate, you know, be involved in the sales process, and things could turn out nice. <laughs> yeah. So, did, so I'm curious about then, uh, you know, so if I think about your first company, um, which was a pioneer in sort of client server technology in, in the late 80s and the 90s. Was there an inspiration to that? Was there, so, what, you know, how did you come up with that? Was that something that you recognized the need and so forth? And yeah, I had a six, six, three companies that I, I started uh, Information Associates, Integral, and then Business Software. And all of them grew nicely t to a couple hundred people. And then bureaucracy set in, uh, fiefdoms, infighting. And the CEO, I didn't know how to solve that. So I solved it for myself by resigning and starting another company. Going, go, yeah. Moving to the next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Turn the problem over to somebody else and, and go start anew. Um, and, and that's what sort of happened with PeopleSoft. I w w had, had turned the company over. This was integral to another fellow. And uh, I was a head of engineering and supporting him. So we had a sales club in, in Hawaii. So my wife, Cheryl, and I, and I went out to Hawaii. I'm sitting there on the beach, and I'm thinking, you know, Windows just came out. Literally about two weeks when Windows 1 came out. Hmm. Now, relational is becoming a standard for databases. PCs were becoming the cool things for business, not just personal use. And so I said, hmm, pretty cool. I think we should rewrite our stuff for, to this, these standards. So I went back, proposed that to the CEO. He said, no, 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 we're going to remain a mainframe company. We're going to go public, and you're going to be here as the founder. And I said, Brian, no, I quit. So I quit. Started PeopleSoft, and 
hired great people. My, my wife was employee number five. <laughs> she, customer service, you know, design, design for the for the product. Um, but it, and I, I put together a business plan that. that showed we weren't going to grow past 50 people because that's when bureaucracy sets in and I'd have to quit and start something new. <laughs> so, so uh, but we did. We grew past 50 people. And <laughs> at, at one point, I said, I came across this book uh, by Jim Collins. Anybody familiar with Jim Collins? He, you know, a, a business guru. But he wrote uh, Beyond Entrepreneurship. So I fell in love with this book. Took the whole management team off site, and what we did was just figure out what our vision was. And vision is three things. Number one, it starts with your core values and beliefs. Two, you establish your pur purpose in life. And three, you set a mission. And the most important thing was were the core values. Mm -hmm. And we determined at that off site that uh, what people saw as core values were employees, number one, customer service, close second. Innovation, fun, integrity, and eventually profitability. It's sort of in, in that order. So, um, and those became our core values, and those remained our core values until the hospital takeover. <laughs> uh, but that's you know, it's really interesting to me <clears throat> when you talk about. I always I always think about because um, I, I in some in some ways I face a similar challenge that you really want to establish what are your values you want to make sure that every day you're you're somehow reinforcing those and I wonder if you could just comment about that can you say a little bit about um, you know so one you mentioned that there was this interesting um, reading that you that sort of uh, helped you to, to, to sort of get beyond 50 you know mm -hmm. and, and to, but is there is there any, are there any other um, comments around Building a culture within a within a within a corporation. I mean, Workday is is even substantially larger than that, and so. But yep. Well, we even Workday adopted the very same core values because they worked, um, and I, 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 it's it's the heart. It's the heart of Cornell. Um, it's the heart of uh, the, the company that I'm with. We've got a, a new one, as, as Martha mentioned, as Ridgeline. Same same core values. You hire people to those. Um, you, you terminate them, frankly, for not observing the core values, not being part of the, the chemistry of the, of the company. Uh, if, if you're one big team, you, you, you can grow and grow and grow and, and still not really f fall afoul of business opportunities or customer service or treating your employees improperly. I mean, it, it's so critical. Um, to any entity that they establish and adhere to their core values. It's primarily the leadership of the place. So Martha made the comment in her introductory remarks about how meeting, you know, meeting Dave is a, Dave is a legend, and you don't quite know, you know, how that is going to feel. And you're the warmest and most genuine person. And every single time you and I have met, I've met other. I, I'll, you you bring students with you. <laughs> and, or former students, you know, alumni, alumni. Or uh, professors. Or professors, or, yeah. <laughs> but it's all, but it, it's all, I've always noticed that, and, and it's just such a great feeling because it's, it's a clear attachment, you know, to the institution, and, and I've, I've just very much appreciated it. So uh, do, is, uh, do you have any words about Workday? So it, it, you, you then, after PeopleSoft kind of ran its course, you, you uh, just a few months later, I mean, you could have at that point said, hey, I'm, I'm, my entrepreneurship time has passed and I'll move on to doing something else. But no, you, you actually went and started something again from scratch. And yeah. uh, what was the inspiration there? Well, first of all, I, I retired f formally from PeopleSoft in 1999. Uh -huh. so, I, so I did retire and, and stayed retired um, until the hostile takeover. And during the hostile takeover, the, the CEO of the company fibbed to Wall Street. And uh, consequently, the, this is after I'm retired for about four years. And uh, uh, so the board decided we need a new CEO for PeopleSoft. And who would want to go back as the CEO during the middle of a hostile takeover 
unless you had gazillion dollars in salary and, and, and benefits. So I, I've signed up to go back <laughs> with, with my good friend and best business friend, Anil Bushri. So we went back to PeopleSoft during the hostile takeover, mm. had the effect of raising the price from $16 a share to 25 So the shareholders, uh, I, I went back to revitalize the employee uh, you know, feelings, uh, right. morale, <coughs> exactly. The customers were worried. Uh, and then my, my friend, Anil, went back to re-engineer re the product plan and the, and the strategy going forward. So together we did a tremendous job, but we, but we ran out of runway. Oracle prevailed, and uh, I, I went back to Tahoe with my wife and, and kids. Um, and then I met up, met up with Anil. We were both sick, you know, uh, depressed. We met in, in Truckee at the Truckee Diner and looked at each other and said, A, we, we have plenty of money you know, from the hostile takeover. Uh, Oracle paid us all. Uh, we had a good reputation. A lot of people were worried about getting fired. Uh, we loved working together. Uh, let's start another company. And we did. And uh, so I went back to work. Uh, she went back to the Bay Area. My wife was in tears. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to amazing success. So, the, so there was, in this case, I guess, the cloud um, computing was kind of really coming into fruition. Yep. And so there was an opportunity there. To there was an opportunity there. And the other opportunity was, we, and I, I don't know if Professor Maxwell would agree with me, but uh, object oriented that oriented programming was, was coming into vogue. Hmm. And we believed in that. We, we bought a little company that had built an object-oriented, not object-based, but object-oriented technology, and frankly exploited that. It happened to be in the cloud. So cloud, object orientation, and then the culture of employees and customer satisfaction, integrity, it all worked. And you know the company today workday. I think Martha said over eight thousand employees were tops in almost every category in the country. Um, diversity, uh, innovation, best companies to work for. We're number one in Ireland, <laughs> uh, number two in Europe, uh, number one company in the country for working parents. Wow. Interesting. Um, so I mean, it, it, it's a really good company. We have our earnings call when is <laughs> about now. in one minute. <laughs> now, Workday's share price will go either down five or up five while we're talking, <laughs> and that will greatly impact subsequent donations you know, to, <laughs> to the engineering school. Okay, so all of our fingers and toes are crossed, yeah. I, I would hope. Uh, so, and then there's Ridgeline, right? And yeah, so I there didn't is. know if you wanted to say a, a few words about it. It's a, it's a brand new company. Brand new. We've got a lot of representation. Yeah, we do. I, I think we have six Cornell people. Uh, there's four right here. Um, the, the top people in their classes, just great folks. Yeah, we're, um, as Martha, Martha said, we're committing ourselves to the back office for uh, financial services. So, you know, portfolio accounting, uh, uh, trade management, you know, customer relationships. Uh, so, and, and built on, you know, new technologies. So, uh, I'm unretired again. <laughs> and, and my wife supports me too, so, so it's really cool. So you've mentioned a couple of times, you know, this is back to the culture, you know, that the idea that work should be fun, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it was explicitly stated in Martha's remarks. And I wonder how you create an environment in which that happens and how important is that to you, that employees feel like this is not only that they're working hard and that, that they're, it's an important job, but it's somehow that, that there's an element of fun to it. Yeah, that, 
we uh, have always believed, people soft work day, that, that people should have fun at work. Not, not only fun in their job, but fun apart from their job, but at work. So, you know, we have bowling leagues and uh, softball teams, uh, the pool tables that you mentioned, you know, snack programs. Uh, uh, at, at PeopleSoft and at Workday, we're known as having the best Halloween parties. Uh, Danny, I don't know where Danny is, but uh, the fellow almost by himself created this enormous venue for kids. And, and their parents with you know, the themes of, during the Halloween time. Kids poured into, into both companies to, to see this, these fun activities. So I think it's really important that uh, fun be part of a, a company. And, and, and it's critical that we, we, we all have a sense of humor. Uh, we can be self-effacing, laugh at ourselves. And I do that all the time. That's terrific. I've, I have one story that I forgot. Uh huh. This is, and this, uh, it's sort of about, well, it's about customers. Um, at, at early work day, well, relatively early work day, a couple of years, um, I'm at my desk, I'm, I'm, I'm in a cubicle, which we standardize on cubicles, no, no offices. Uh, but I'm sitting there and I, I get a letter, and it's a page and a half letter tirade of how disappointed this customer is. He had just purchased Workday, and he's irate. And he goes, a page and a half worth of where we did him wrong. Uh, we not only misled him during the sales process, but once he signed the, the contract, we changed the product plans so that important features that he wanted were no longer going to be available. So I get this letter. I, we had just hired our, our president. Our, I was the, the CEO. He's the president. I said, Mike, we got to go see this guy. I set up the appointment. Uh, we drive in the car about an hour away down um, in the South Bay. Go into the this company's offices. It's called Infinera. They're, they're, anybody heard of Infinera? Yeah, I have. You know. <laughs> Sorry. Was that, was that a, it's got some Cornell connection. Oh, it does? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> Positive Cornell connection? Let's talk offline. Oh, offline. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it doesn't change the story. I hope not. I hope not. I so hope. Mike and I go down, and we're greeted by the chief HR guy and his IT person. And it's basically a re reiteration of the letter. Yeah. And, okay. Say, so Mike. I said, we got to go back and look into this more. So we go back, check into the salespeople, and what happened, and what, why did we change the product plans, and blah, blah, blah. So I write this guy a letter back and ask if we could meet with him to discuss it further. So we get back there, uh, drive down again, Mike and I. Not only were we greeted by the chief HR person, the IT person, but now the CEO. The CEO. And before we can get in the room, the HR guy stands up and says, Dave, we are happy Workday customers. We are thrilled. We appreciate what you've done. And the CEO gets up and said, Dave, Mike, I want to give you a tour of the plant. Gives us a tour of the plant, gives me a little uh, ceremonial cube with their latest optical chip in it. And we go home, we now have this happy customer. Wow. Doesn't end there. <laughs> Our biggest and most important customer, Flextronics, I don't, I don't know if you have a connection there, too. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't think so. Oh, they, they, they make a lot of the popular devices for Samsung and mm -hmm. Apple. and it, the, the, Nobody knows they do this, but they're, they're 200,000 employees. Anyway, I, I get to ask to introduce their CHRO of 200,000 employees to a group of a couple hundred chief HR, how are we doing here? Chief HR people, <laughs> uh, I mean 200 prospects, okay? So I introduced the Flextronics guy, he talks about the HR transformation, and toward the end of his, his I'd sit down, like much like 
people on the front here. And he gets to the end and talks about his workday implementation. When, when he mentions workday, there's a fellow at the back of the room that jumps up, says, I'm a workday customer too, and we love it. Can't ask. The same guy from Infinera. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and the point is, what was that, the, what solved the problem for them? So, I'm curious about the, the transformation. Communication. It was a communication, yeah, yeah. and and, and a, we we did take them steps, and apologize, of course, mm, and mm. and tweak the product plan to help them out. Uh, but I think it was just more of a, a demonstration of of what you stand for, and so that that's a good example of stand stand by your core values, and it will help sell additional business hmm. you know, for you, and which it did. So you and I talked about this offline. Um, and just to the members of the audience, I'll, I'll just a couple of words about this. Um, you may have noticed there's a lot of entrepreneurship programming in the college that's growing and growing. And it, basically, it's filled as soon as I build it kind of, kind of situation, which is really, uh, in my opinion, very exciting. Part of this came out of um, when we were applying for the Cornell Tech Campus, we did a, a, a survey of our alumni and discovered a really remarkable thing in terms of the f number of our alumni that were founders. And in fact, at, at the pace that of the schools that are really sort of noteworthy for this, which are Stanford and MIT, um, it's just that we're just doing it in the typical Cornell way, very quietly and subtly. And we, you know, people like you were in the Bay Area and so forth. You didn't see it in, in our backyard. And um, so, um, so I'm very proud of that. Like this is something that I think we're now establishing our own reputation. I think Cornell Tech helps tremendously. But you know, so, so I say all of that because I think really this audience is predominantly students. And um, in my opinion, all of them, or some of them, uh, maybe budding entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and you as a successful one, um, perhaps the most successful I personally have ever met, I wondered you know, if you had any words of wisdom or advice, what, what, do you, what would you say to them that, you know, to inspire them and to, because it's hard work, uh, you have to really um, have, you probably have to knuckle under some pretty tough times like the one you just described. Yeah. Uh, but I'm curious if you had any, any uh, sort of pearls of wisdom for them. I, I would say, I mean, I, I'm blessed with the Cornell experience, the IBM experience, and opportunities to you know, branch out. I, I would say, if, unless you're a Mark Zuckerberg or a, you know, a Bill Gates and you you're figure out something in your dorm room, um, if you're sort of normal people like me, you, you, I, I, the advice I would, I would give is, A, when you graduate, Join a great company, I mean, a, a great company. I joined IBM, it was great. Um, the, a great company to me today would be Amazon, um, Microsoft, uh, Apple. I, I'd say Workday is a great company. I, 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 I'm, I'm no longer the CEO, but I am the chairman. Um, so do that. You know, uh, Ridgeline, join our team. We're, we got the A team here, and talking An to you. An impressive group. You're A player. So that's it. First thing, join a great company, hmm. and uh, be be in sales. Not carrying a bag or being on quota, but be aware that it's important that your company sell its products. Um, and so, whether you're in administration or development or you know you're. You know, so yeah, well you got you got to be in sales. Uh, thirdly, um, innovate. Go go to this great company and, and look around for a problem to solve, and, you know, and do it well. Um, and whether it's helping sell a new customer, or helping fix a customer problem, doing an internal IT project, you know, to make things more smooth. Uh, fourthly, I'd say hone your com communication skills. I, I may have gotten a 425 in my English SAT, but I, I taught myself that English was really, really important mm. at the age of 23. Mm. So uh, I waited too long. Yeah. But, but that's important, whether it's writing or presenting, uh, just general communicating, it's super important. And, and fifthly, and, and 
very important, work your ass off. Hmm. Uh, so join a great company, be in sales, innovate, you know, communicate properly, and, and then work hard. And I, th then you'll be eligible for promotion, success, salary increases, or possibly even branching out on your own with all the, the skills that you've built up. Yeah, that's terrific. So at this point, um, I'd like to give the audience a chance to ask questions. So if there are questions, I see a hand here. Just just stand up and maybe name and year and then your question. Hi, my name is Shang Chen. Uh, oh, I didn't realize we had it. OK. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Shang Chen. Uh, I'm a grad student in systems engineering. Uh, first year here, so brand new to Cornell, originally from the Bay Area, so oh, yeah. have a connection there. Welcome. Uh, thank you. And so I think I have two questions, if that's, if that's okay. Go. Okay. The first one is, so when you failed that class, what were the steps you took to overcome that failure? Because I feel like for a lot of us at Cornell, we're very high achievers. So a bad grade like that mm -hmm. could be you know, super, super detrimental. That's something we can't really get over. Uh, so that's the first question. Um, I don't know if I can answer that first. I just say you have to recognize that you failed, and you're not typically that way. Uh, pick yourself up by bootstraps and, and try again. And uh, this fine gentleman gave me a second chance. So, so I, th I think it just has to come internally. Uh, so I mean, I, I proved that I was a good student in high school and grammar school. And I proved that I was a lousy student, you know, during a particularly tough period of time. Thank you. Um, and the second question is, so when do you know it's the point or it is the time to leave that first company that you joined that's really great to maybe start your entrepreneurial journey? Well, with me, it, it, it just hit. I, I, I was with IBM. I'd been very successful. I, I was on a sales team for higher education. We were the top team in the branch, and the branch was the top branch in the division. And we were on a high. Uh, and and just another little story. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with a mathematician, built a, an exam scheduling system, final exam scheduling, uh, and, and you know, traveling salesman and algorithm and the like. This guy did the math. I did the PL1 around it and went out and tried to sell it to other universities. We, we, customer was RIT, just down the road. Right? Uh, it, and wound up selling a few, with IBM's permission, because the, the service would be run on the University of Rochester Model 65. Uh, so I s sold about four or five, and then th say, I should do this for a living. <laughs> and that would, that's what caused me to, to leave the most magnificent job in the world, to, to sort of try something on my own. So another question? It's difficult for me to see. Hi, uh, I'm Hadi, junior in ECE. Um, so why did you do it? It's probably was hard. There were a lot of hard times, and there were times when you thought that everything's falling apart. So what made you keep going? Uh, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> it was my mom. Yeah, uh, it was tough times. Uh, uh, and some advice, and it's uh, probably too late for the audience, but it, fall in love in high school, all right? <laughs> at, at least once. You know, and get that out of your system. <laughs> my, you know, my first serious girlfriend was Lori's mom, and I just went nuts. And but I recovered thanks to my <laughs> thanks to my mom, and uh, <laughs> graduated. I, I, by the way, in this very Phillips 101, I took a course from Dr. Torn. Anybody hear of that fella? Did you remember him? Yeah, he, he taught um, what, sequencing, um, uh, circuitry, 
circuit sequence. <laughs> it was a graduate school, a graduate course, and, and I was, a, I think I was a junior, and wound up getting the top grade in this course with all the graduate students. So I, in this very room, uh, so I, I, I proved that I, I could do it if, if I needed to. <laughs> Uh, so that, that was another little point of recovery. But it, it, it was my mom that, that... I'm curious, but in, in, uh, I, I'm not sure if the, con if the context was just that, but also in the case of when you're starting a company, I imagine there must also be some uh, very uh, soul-searching moments about, you know, is this thing going to survive or not, especially in the early stages of it. And, and uh, you know, what, where, do you, where do you find that uh, ability to... To, you know, to keep charging forward even, even as you may be sort of experiencing some elements of doubt mm -hmm. about it? Um, is, there, is there a sort of trick to, to how to stay upbeat and positive even as you're not sure you're going to yeah. make it? I, I, it? Well, you need funding. And our, my very first job outside of IBM, we, we were funded by our parents, uh, our friends, you know, so, so that we could keep going. The, the exam scheduler basically is done. We just had to sell it. You know, my my co-founder at this first company was a, a, a the sales partner at IBM. And while I was out selling the exam scheduler and running it by myself, uh, he was selling me as a programmer, you know, to the local universities. So, so we 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 bootstrapped our our way that way. I see. I see. So. But the, there wasn't any venture capital back then. Right. <laughs> One last question from the audience. There's a hand here. Hi there, Mr. Duffield. Um, my name is Jack Nichols. I'm a freshman. I'm actually not in engineering. I'm in the arts and sciences, but I'm really passionate about entrepreneurship. And there's so much I don't know about this, so I'm, I'm really curious to be here. Um, my question is, Mr. Duffield, what do you think the biggest hindrance is right now in the workplace in companies not as advanced as companies like Workday that's getting in the way of effective communication and productivity? Uh, that's, it's simple. It's just leadership. It's, it starts with the company's leaders and, uh, you know, sort of, filters down from there. So uh, I, we're, we're, I've been blessed with really top people in my life and shared the same value system and uh, w w consequently we're, we're able to, to grow the organizations and you know, continue to attract top talent, young, young folks, older folks too. So I, I don't wouldn't know how to fix a, a broken organization, but but I I do know how to you know create one and keep it going, sustaining it through through good times and bad times, uh, both financial and you know international uh, political you know a lot, a lot of things to consider. Thank you. But, well, it's it's incredibly powerful to see what you know you've built, and I and I again I, for me it is something I keep coming back to that issue of culture because I think it's probably the area that um, you know even in my uh, very different job um, I, I recognize the importance of it and um, and the role that senior senior leaders within the within the college or the university play in sustaining it. Um, and uh, congratulate you on having built it multiple times over. So I want to um, now sort of segue into the more um, sort of formal. Uh, pre <laughs> By the way, congratulations to Cornell. Uh, we're actively looking at in the, the blockchain technology, mm. and a, a recent poll shows that next to Stanford, Cornell is the one most engaged in, in, in blockchain. And I was going to say, the Stanford is probably mostly hype, so it's oh, Cornell's right. number that's one, because right. we all know the truth. Yeah. 
So that so, maybe that's, that's so the person who actually made that comment and made me think of saying it is Greg Morissette, who's very much it's computing and information sciences that's uh, okay. that's leading that charge. So fantastic, <laughs> makes us proud. Yes. So um, let me just uh, a, a few words here. So the college has produced many, many, many extraordinary and talented engineers in its 150-year history. And graduates who, in my opinion, have changed uh, whole industries uh, through their leadership and, and their entrepreneurship. And it's been a wonderful privilege of mine as a dean to be able to meet uh, these people. You know, one of the interesting hidden um, treasures about being a dean, everyone thinks, every faculty member thinks that it's really a hard part of the job, it turns out it's an incredibly gratifying part of the job to be able to meet people like, like Dave and others who are uh, so incredibly influential. So it's really one of my uh, great privileges. And then I wanted to say a little bit about what I think makes Cornell Engineering tick. You know, why, why are we the way we are? Um, and I think we blend two things. Um, we blend rigorous fundamentals, a kind of no nonsense, and you, you beautifully and very generously talked about your own trials and tribulations getting through this place. I, when I talk to freshmen as they're coming in, I have to be very honest. This is a no-nonsense place, I mean, in, in that sense. But we blend it with a sense of practical mission and practical purpose. And I feel like that is the land-grant ivy. Like, we, we sort of bring those two, th those two uh, things together. And I think that it, 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 the practical training that we, do, we talk about today, uh, things like the project teams, which are, which are now organizing themselves out in the, in the atrium, uh, our entrepreneurship programming, leadership programming, communications programming, and so forth, um, I, I think it, it sort of brings that well-roundedness uh, to our engineers. Dave, you uh, embody uh, the best of these ideals, um, and, and it's a, it is really remarkable. You have a nose for the gaps in software, where there are opportunities, and how to fill those gaps with really interesting companies with really interesting cultures. And most importantly to me is your uh, sense of um, personal mission as far as this is concerned. You're, you're trying to improve the lives of the millions of people that use your software and the thousands of people that work f with you. Um, and, I, and I admire both of those greatly, and I feel like I try to take lessons from them in my, in my own work. So thank you for being such an incredible example uh, to us all. And on behalf of 230-ish faculty, about 5,000 students, and oh, well over 40,000 living alumni, I am very proud to present you with Cornell Engineering's inaugural Distinguished Alumnus Award, which is show, which is oh my show goodness, present. I'm not going to pick it up. Congratulations. Thank you. So great, much. great to have you. Here. Come on. Yeah. You want me to hold it? <laughs> I'm afraid of it. Okay. All right. We're going to do it. It looks heavy. And it's two pieces. That's oh, the. Oh. That's the. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm going to leave this here. And I think we're just going to.